Hello and welcome to the episode 11 of the Social Innovation Think Tank, where we discuss the latest ideas and thinking about social innovation. My name is Paul Tracy. I'm Professor of Innovation and Organisation at the Cambridge Judge Business School and Co-Director of the Cambridge Centre for Social Innovation. We have here as well my colleague and co-host, Neil Stott, who's also Co-Director of the Cambridge Centre for Social Innovation and who also leads the Master's Programme that we run in the centre as well. And I'm delighted to welcome today's guest, who is Dr. Samantha Rosehill. Samantha is the Assistant Director of the Hannah Arendt Centre for Politics and Humanities and Visiting Assistant Professor of Politics at Bard College in New York. Uh, she's also Associate Faculty at the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research in New York City. Uh, a political scientist by training, her research and Tika's teaching focus on critical theory, uh, democratic theory, and uh, the history of political thought. And we invited Samantha on today to talk about her book on Hannah Arendt that is coming out later this year, and more broadly to talk about her work with the Hannah Arendt Centre. Now, Samantha will tell us uh, about Hannah Arendt in, in a moment in, in more detail, but very briefly, she is, uh, as you may well know, one of the most influential political thinkers of the 20th century, who wrote on a tremendous range of uh, different topics, but is perhaps most well known for her work on uh, totalitarianism. And it's interesting that um, Hannah Arendt's ideas are gaining some traction in the business school community at the moment. There's a couple of uh, papers published uh, just recently that Neil forwarded to me this morning. Um, and, um, you know, we think that there are potentially important and powerful implications of her ideas for social innovators and for social innovation. So we think this is a, a good time to be having, having the conversation. So Samantha, thank you very much uh, for talking with us and for and for being part of this think tank. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. So let, let us just start off by um, asking you to talk a little bit about your work on Hannah Arendt and um, you, your work with the center in particular. Yeah, so thank you again. Um, I have been working on Hannah Arendt for almost 20 years now, um, really since uh, the beginning of college when I discovered the human condition. Um, I fell in love with her prose style and ended up taking something like nine directed studies just so that I could read Hannah Arendt and her um, antecedents. So I've been thinking about Arendt for a while and carrying her around as an interlocutor in my thinking about our contemporary political situation, um, our contemporary cultural issues. And it's been a great pleasure over the past four to five years in particular to make her work more accessible um, to a broader public audience. Um, and in that way, I kind of view myself as a Hannah Arendt translator. <laughs> so of course you're getting my re reading of Hannah Arendt, um, but I think that there's such provocation and richness in her work um, that it really appeals to a wide variety of readers across the political spectrum and can inform the way that we think about a variety of social and political issues. So that's what I've kind of been up to um, between my writing, translating aren't uh, translating her poems for the past uh, 10 years now, actually. Um, and I just finished a biography of Hannah Arendt. It's an introductory biography to the life and work of Arendt meant to introduce the reader um, to the core ideas and themes in her work um, and also give you a sense of who she was as a person um, because that's very tied to what she was writing about. Um, and that'll be out um, in summer, as you said. For the past six years, I've also been the assistant, well, past three years, I've been the assistant director of the Hannah Arendt Center for Politics and Humanities at Bard College. I've been at the center for six years now. And my work there has mostly focused on facilitating difficult conversations. Um, so I have been the faculty advisor for a new program that we developed called the Tough Talks program that brings together students with different political opinions to talk about uh, contentious political questions, like should abortion be legal? Should we get rid of the death penalty? And so on. And the conversations are designed specifically to allow individuals to meet one another first on a personal level. And then the conversation is guided 
by a series of questions so that each person has the ability to share their opinion. And at the end of the conversation, everybody is asked to uh, say something that they learned. So it's meant to draw together um, individuals uh, who share, who have different political opinions, but who share other things in common and to draw both the differences and the similarities. The other uh, project that I've been working on at the center is a poetry and philosophy project, which is tied to my own interest and work on Hannah Arendt's poems, uh, drawing together philosophers and poets to address political uh, questions. So that's, that's mostly what I've been up to. Um, we also have a virtual reading group that meets on uh, Friday afternoons. Um, it's open to members um, and you can join by signing up at the Han Arendt Center. Good. Thank you very much. I think that gives us a really nice sense of what you do in the, in the work of the center. Could you tell us now a little bit more specifically who Hannah Arendt was and um, a little bit about what you see as her most important contributions to knowledge? Sure. So Hannah Arendt was a 20th century German Jewish political thinker and philosopher, although she would tell you that she was not a philosopher, um, that she did the work of political theory. Um, she was trained as a philosopher, though. Um, she was born in Linden, Hanover, Germany in 1906. When she was three, her family moved to Königsberg, which was the capital of East Prussia at the time, because her father was dying from syphilis. So that's where she grew up. Her life was affected by World War I. Um, she was kicked out of high school when she was about 15 for leading a protest against one of her teachers. So she finished her studies uh, at Berlin, um, which is where she fell in love with theology and philosophy. Uh, and then she went to the University of Marburg to study with Martin Heidegger. Um, and he was just beginning his work on being in time. She was a muse for him while uh, he was writing. Um, and he is one of the fathers of German existentialism. Uh, she left uh, working with him to write her dissertation at the University of Heidelberg with the other great German father of existentialism, Karl Jaspers, um, where she worked on, again, theology, Greek, and philosophy, and wrote about the concepts of love and the work of St. Augustine. Um, she was a journalist after that. She wrote for the Frankfurt Allgemeine. Um, she would write uh, book reviews um, while she was starting to work on her Habilitation, which was about Rachel Varnhagen and the Jewish salon tradition. And she increasingly became more political in those years between 1929 and 1933. She knew earlier than most what was beginning to happen in Germany. Um, and after the burning of the Reichstag, she said that she had to leave philosophy, that she couldn't be a bystander, and that she had to do political work. So she began working um, with a friend for the World Zionist Organization, and she was doing research in the Prussian State Library collecting anti-Semitic propaganda, which was a crime under the Nazi regime. Um, and she was arrested. She was, in, she was held by the Gestapo for about eight days, um, and when she was released, she fled to Paris. She spent the next nine years working with different Zionist organizations, helping Jewish youth escape um, Europe and get to then Palestine. Um, and in the summer of 1940, she was interned for about five and a half weeks in Gers. Um, eventually, with the help of Varian Fry and some forged papers, she was able to escape to the United States. Um, um, and when she came to the United States, she spent her first summer here as here. Uh, I'm in New York right now, but in Massachusetts as a housekeeper. Um, and then she went back to the work of organizing Jewish politics, writing for newspapers. She had a weekly column in a German uh, paper for refugees. Um, and she started adjunct lecturing on European history at Brooklyn College while she was writing her first major work, The Origins of Totalitarianism. So that's how her career started and it was really origins that moved her um, into the framework of being a public intellectual. Um, and so what are her most important contributions? I think 
that there are, are a lot of important contributions. If we want to approach that question from the framework of political theory, I think one of our most important and lasting contributions in the legacy of contemporary political theory and critical theory has been the work she's done on the human condition and the public sphere. Um, the understanding of the importance of the public sphere in politics, um, her early work on speech acts as a form of political action became very influential for thinkers like Jürgen Habermas and Judith Butler, who do different things with her work, but is still, I think, had a great impact on our contemporary political landscape. The Origins of Totalitarianism is an incredible work. It was the first systematic account of how totalitarianism had emerged in the middle of the 20th century. And what was so novel about it at the time it was published was that the common narrative had been that totalitarianism was the apex of the nation state. It was the triumph, the conclusion of the nation state. And Arendt argues that it's the decline of the nation state, that the emergence of totalitarianism. Today, I think we can, we, we would think in terms of populism, different things, but populism is our political problem, I would say right now. Um, and that it actually reflects the decline and weaknesses of the nation state. And her approach to totalitarianism has had a lasting influence on contemporary literature that deals with populism and fascism, especially in the past five years after the election of Donald Trump and Boris Johnson um, in the UK, Bolsonaro in Brazil, and so on. And so there are there are so many different ways to answer this question. And I'll just add one more. Um, the banality of evil, I think most people would say is her most important contribution. Um, she changed the way that we think about evil doers. Um, and I, I still think there's a common conception many people hold of evil doers as being monsters, as being monstrous. And we expect them to be inhuman in that otherworldly way. But Arendt really gives us a way to understand evil as being human, as being a human phenomenon. Great, thank, thank you very much. Um, so thinking about, I mean, you've given a good sense of her, her life and some of the key, the key ideas that she uh, wrote about. What about relevance to now, relevance to the 21st century? You mentioned populism. Is that, you think it's main contemporary relevance or are there other, other areas as well? I think that there are other areas as well. Again, just let me say, I think aren't someone to think with. I don't think that she's the only person people should think with. Um, so when Arendt died in 1975, she was actually mostly known for her reportage on the trial of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem and the intellectual fury that unfolded after that trial. And the banality of evil was much more associated with her than her work on totalitarianism. And it wasn't until 1982 when Elizabeth Young Brule published the first biography of Arendt working with the archived papers that academics, I'll say, began to take an active interest in her work. And then, of course, also the details of her relationship with Martin Heidegger came to light and other factors that made her an interesting figure to write about. Um, but that's changed. That's changed a lot since the early 1980s. And since the election of Donald Trump in 2016, Origins became a number one bestseller. And people were ordering it and reading it to try to begin to understand what was happening in American politics. Um, the question that I was asked constantly during the Trump presidency was, is America fascist now? Has America become a fascist country? And my answer was, and still is, no, America is not a fascist country. But if we follow Arendt's methodology and thinking about the emergence of totalitarianism, one of the things that she teaches us is that just because there isn't a fascist political system, that doesn't mean there aren't elements of fascism that exist within a society. And let me just add to that, for Arendt, unlike 
the critical theorist of the Frankfurt School tradition, that does not mean that fascism inheres in democracy. It means something else. And she's taking a kind of Walter, Walter Benjamin, uh, Walter Benjamin uh, uh, approach to the way that she's thinking about how elements crystallize together in origins. So I think that those elements are very relevant to how we understand populism, I'll say right-wing populism in America today. She talks about the privatization of public institutions, about the mentality of imperialism and capitalism, which hungers for power after power in this never-ending quest uh, to expand um, and to conquer. She talks about how populist leaders or fascist leaders appeal to the masses who were not previously engaged in electoral politics. And I think just as a couple of examples, those things are very relevant to what's happening right now. And there's there's more to say about that. But I, I would argue actually that the most important work for our contemporary political moment is the human condition. Um, and I've been teaching the human condition more than usual because of that. Um, and I think that in the human condition, we find an argument about the rise of the social, the dangers of the rise of the social, the loss of physical public space and the importance of physical public space to political life, to the vibrancy of political life. We find an argument about how isolation uh, deprives us of our ability to act in concert with one another and create new beginnings in the world. In the preface, she has an uncanny sentence about how we are all going to become slaves to our technological devices and that it was incredibly prescient. And she is drawing all of these different elements together about the loss of private space, the loss of intimacy, the loss of the public sphere, to talk about how we are gradually losing our freedom. And she's not hopeful that we can get it back. She's not hopeful that we can reconstitute the public space for political freedom. And she's not hopeful that we can reclaim the private, which is necessary for thinking. Um, for solitude, for being able to retreat from the world of appearances and be alone with ourselves in a way that is nourishing. She's afraid that we're losing intimacy. Um, and she says that a life lived entirely in public becomes shallow. And I was just going to say before Zoom interrupted me that, you know, Arendt was writing this in 19... Uh, around 1956, 57, it was published in 1958. And she's thinking about the future development of technological society. Um, so I would say the human condition is the book people should be reaching for right now. Thank you very much, Neil. So, I mean, a lot of her work is about very dark times, you know, which you, you've highlighted. And then you started to touch on the, the hope in, in her work. So what intrigued, intrigued me is, is what does she mean? How did, what does she mean by positive social change and how do we achieve it? So I think there's two different things I'm, I'm hearing in your question. One is how does Hannah Arendt treat hope? Especially how do we think about what it means to have hope politically in, in dark times? And the other question is how does a hope shape our understanding of what's possible politically and how can it possibly shape political change um, and organizing for political change. So Arendt was wary of hope. <laughs> um, she says at the beginning of the origins of totalitarianism that radical hope and radical despair are dangerous, that they turn us away from what's in front of us, from the present. In this way, I think Arendt is an incredibly powerful political thinker in our contemporary political climate because she really refuses any kind of utopian horizon in thinking about how we address present political problems. Um, and 
with that, any form of nostalgia or longing for a past um, that cannot be reclaimed um, in any way. She felt free to think the world anew. And one of the things that she consistently says is that we have to rethink the world anew from our most recent lived experiences. And so what does that mean for the question of making social change? If we take away any kind of utopian horizon or nostalgic longing for the past, or we take away the idea that we can see the future somehow or predict the future. The first thing is that social change is spontaneous. Political action for Hannah Arendt has to be spontaneous. I think we saw this in, in, in and we've seen it a few times in the past 20 or so years, spontaneous uh, political protest movements. Um, whether one agrees with them or doesn't disagree with them, they appeared um, and happened at a certain historical moment. Um, and in that way, social change is spontaneous. It's not something um, that one systematically moves toward. And what I mean by that is Hannah Arendt did not subscribe to narratives of progress. <laughs> she thought that the idea of progress was dangerous. Um, and she saw how the emergence of mass society and concentration camps um, were in part connected to the idea of progress, uh, to an idea that society could be constantly improved. But what's more than that is she thought that if we demand a narrative of progress um, for the future of society, is that we are constantly demanding the, be the better uh, and forsaking the good. She believed in the good. And she's very Aristotelian and I'll say even plat and platonic in that sense. She didn't let go of the idea of the good. And so political action in her understanding happens when individuals spontaneously come together. Wherever people come together in a public space, the possibility for political action is present. So I would say that's the second part of what she teaches us about organizing for social change. It requires that we do it with others. Social change is not something that is done by individuals. It's something that has to emerge from a collective. It can be a collective of two, it can be a collective of a thousand or a million, but it has to happen in concert with other people. And moving from that, for her, her, social change requires a form of political solidarity. Uh, and it's a form of political solidarity that is not rooted in identity, but is rooted in a celebration of plurality and difference and grounded in political principles and not uh, the affective feeling of empathy or pity or any kind of uh, what, you know, the Rousseauian passions. Um, it has to be staked in, in principles because feelings change. Um, and for her, she thought that wherever political solidarity was rooted in empathy and pity for an underclass, that it would only lead to social violence. And so she moves us toward ideals of things like public happiness, the idea that we can actually get joy <laughs> and pleasure out of participating in politics. And I'll say the fourth thing that comes to mind is that there's no end in the process of social change. It's not like uh, we have a Marxist idea of utopian society, eight hours for work, eight hours for sleep, eight hours for pleasure and fishing. It's, an, it's a horizon without a future. We have to constantly be attuning our thinking and our senses to the world as it is right now. And so there's no end in the process of advocating for social change. But Arnett also, I will say, um, you know, she drew a sharp distinction between what is political and what is social. So for her, a question like housing is one example she gives is not a political question. The 
idea that everybody has a right to good housing, to adequate housing, is not up for debate. This is not a topic for de political debate. This is a common human right, and it should be left to bureaucrats to administer economically in the most efficient way possible. And so she takes what we would, I think, put front and center is political questions, housing, uh, women's rights concerning the body, uh, gay marriage, um, all of these things for her are not political questions. Um, they're social questions. And so what is political? Well, populism would be a political question, the organization of government. Um, and it doesn't mean, of course, that housing isn't political. Everything can be touched by politics. And of course, that conversation is politically charged. But the administration of housing for her was not political. So <clears throat> I am... Um... Oh, we've been reading quite a bit about Hannah over the last week or so. It is tough going at times. It is quite challenging. My brain has been stretched somewhat. And thank you very much for clarifying some things. Um, one thing, and correct me if I'm wrong, she, she separated the idea of nation and state. She was very worried about the nation bit of the nation state, in, in particular around people who were stripped of their citizenship or their statehood or their nationhood, i.e. refugees, migrants. Now you can see why given her history, but I felt that's a really quite important piece of the puzzle given, you know, migration and refugee camps, et cetera, today. Am I right or is that off beam? No, no, you're right. So I assume you're reading that in Origins um, yeah. in the chapter on rights, which is one of the most famous parts of the origins of totalitarianism. So Arne is a concept, let me just say first, Arne is a conceptual thinker and she's constantly drawing distinctions in order to attune us to differences that are otherwise flattened, like between private social public, between racism and race thinking, between the nation and the nation state. Um, she's making a kind of historical political argument, although I never hold Arendt to her history. She, I, I don't think one should read her as a historian. Um, but no, you're right in that. And she argues that, look, the purpose of the nation state as a political entity was to guarantee the rights of citizens. And the nation state within political science discourse um, is related to, you know, a certain set of factors, sovereign territorial borders, certain amount of self-sufficiency for the economy and so on. Um, but for Arendt, it's the question of rights. And when the chips were down, as she would say, the nation state failed. It, 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 it absolutely failed and it collapsed. Um, in terms of morality and also in terms of legality, politically. Uh, morally, it collapsed because the norms completely dissolved and it suddenly became legal to murder people. And legally, the state disenfranchised a large part of the population and could not guarantee the rights of the most vulnerable parts of the population. It turned against them. So the way that she addresses that in part is by arguing that we need an international body that can guarantee the rights of people that's not rooted in the nation state. Um, so citizenship rights, uh, particularly, and one of the things that in a little, it's not even an interview, it's a memo that she wrote to the University of Chicago Committee on Social Change. She argues that the United States needs a constitutional amendment to guarantee citizenship to all peoples who um, emigrated, immigrated uh, to the United States because they are threatened with their citizenship. And we saw that with Donald Trump's presidency. We saw these vulnerable populations being threatened with their citizenship, where citizenship is no longer a right, but it is a political instrument 
that is used by political leaders in power. And so she argues that we need, that we have the right to have rights. She also differentiated between um, labor, work, and action. Could you, could you briefly explain that to me, please? <laughs> How much time do you have? Yeah, briefly. <laughs> again, again, that's found in the human condition, but if you're looking for a shortcut for anybody listening out there in the beautiful volume, Thinking Without a Bannister, there's about, I think it's about eight to 10 pages called Labor, Work, and Action, where she summarizes the distinction. So she is worried that all activity is becoming labor in contemporary society, um, which means that all making, the activity of making and creating um, has been transformed into labor within capitalist society so that when you make something, it's judged through an instrumental utilitarian framework. So I'll just give you, that's, that's part of the takeaway argument. Labor, uh, it corresponds to the biological life processes of the body. So it is produced to be consumed and transformed into a waste product. Um, work is, she describes as homo faber. It's the work of our hands um, where we transform material into things, we make things. And if you have read your Marx, you're hearing Marx in my language. Um, this book began as a treatise on Marx. Um, she says at the beginning of the chapter on labor, Karl Marx is going to be criticized here. Um, but she holds work apart from labor. And she argues that the distinction between labor and work has been lost. Work allows us to build the world in common. It's the human artifice that we make. So poems, stories, buildings, works of art, sculptures, books, public spaces, design, one might think of. These are all forms of work. They create the world, the physical material world that forms our daily life, that we move through physically, and that gives us a sense of durability. Work gives us a sense of continuity and durability. In one of the poems she wrote after the war, she starts by saying, um, I know that the streets have been destroyed and I know that the houses have been destroyed. We thought that they were sturdier than we, right? And so we attribute a kind of permanence and lastiness to the physical artifice of the world that gives us a sense of durability. And related to that is storytelling which is probably the most important pol political act we can engage in, I would say, perhaps for Arendt. Um, stories give us a sense of holding the world in common. So action. Um, action is coming together in a public space to act in concert with one another. Um, action is related to the ability to create new beginnings in the world and action um, is related to our ability to speak and act. So for Arendt, what makes us human? And every political philosopher has a different answer to this question. Um, I just brought up Marx, who's important for Arendt's thinking here. He says in the economic and philosophic manuscripts that we have a natural ability to transform material uh, object, uh, to transform material nature into objects. Right? And this is our fundamental power. For Arendt, she's more Aristotelian than that. And she says that plurality is the, what makes us human, right? The fact that we exist with others. No man is an island. Nobody exists alone. We exist with others. And our lives, our identity, our sense of self are conditioned constantly by the presence of others and the material things that have preceded our existence in the world. And the other side of that that's important for action is that the, is, is the way she describes equality. We're only equal in the sense that we're unequal. Every individual is unique and we express our uniqueness through our speech and our actions. And that differentiates us from one another. 
Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you, I can give you more. <laughs> You're like we, might, we, might, uh, we might lose our audience. So a final question, um, linking it back to where we started about social innovation. You know, um, some people involved in social innovation may have heard of, of Hannah, many may not have done. What do you think uh, she has to offer to today's social innovators, those people who are trying to make, you know, positive social change? So I think there are a few different things she can offer. I think the most important thing that Orrent has to offer anyone, and I, I think it's especially important for people who are actively engaged in creating social change and doing the work of making social innovation um, is thinking. Uh, most of her work is about thinking. So I like that you said, Neil, that she was messing with your with your head, expanding, <laughs> expanding things. Um, <laughs> because that's how she describes it. We have we have to constantly expand our imaginations. Um, we expand our imaginations by engaging with the world and as much of the world as we can. And that is what ultimately makes us more empathetic to others. And that's one of the things that we're losing today, especially in social media culture, in a, a, a culture that is facing uh, a, a plague of social isolation. Um, is that ability um, to go wandering. Um, so I think she offers a mindset, a way of thinking, uh, and there are different elements of that. So one, um, you, are, you have to embrace the mindset of a beginner. You have to constantly be willing to begin again. There is no end in thinking. Uh, she says in one of her lectures from 1955 that, you know, concepts are never the end of a thinking process. They're wellsprings. So I think that shifts the temporal dimensions in which we think about what social change means. There's no end to the process. This is a lifelong, endless engagement that we have to be participating in. But when we embrace the mindset of a beginner, we also acquire a kind of freedom in our thinking that's not constrained by certain social pressures or political norms or a school of thought that we've been trained up in. Um, and I think that's um, fruitful for creative thinking, for finding creative solutions and problems. And I think it's incredibly hard um, we were just talking about the human condition. That's the book I would point people toward because she talks so much about the process of making um, and what it means to make things together. And building on that, she really uh, gives us a sense of the importance of public space and how we design public space to optimize engagement instead of social isolation. And I, I, I would love to talk to some social media designers um, about the way that platforms are constructed. Um, you know, I think one of one of the interesting paradoxes we face right now in thinking about a, a, a problem like social isolation um, is that people are more social than ever, but they're also lonelier and more isolated than ever. And so how do we optimize social engagement so that people are actually less isolated? Um, and I think Arendt's human condition has some interesting pointers for that, but I think you know, following her thinking, we have to think about these questions from our most recent experiences as well. So that's where I would start. Well, one thing I like about her and her life and her work is she makes practice politics as well as being an academic you know she was an activist not an academic okay whatever word you want to use intellectual perhaps she said not... intellectual was a hateful word she? okay what would she have used she was a political thinker 
she was a thinker. Thinking is an active, engaged thing. We, I think, let's we. I'll let you go with public intellectual. Okay. So I mean, she she blended all these different different activities, which I think she was also fairly trenchant and uh, controversial at times, as you as you mentioned. Yes. Um, Paul, over to you. Well, I mean, I think we could probably chat for a, a, a long time more, so I'm just conscious of, of, of time. I just want to thank you very much indeed for sharing those thoughts with us and you know, the depth of your knowledge really came through uh, really clearly. So thank you very much uh, for, for joining us. My pleasure. Um, and it's been, it's been fun to talk with you. I think it's the beginning of a conversation and it's, it's a great topic. So thank you for having me.